Hello and welcome to the third installment of the Columbia Alumni Leaders Experience in collaboration with Columbia at Home. My name is Jaleesa Britton and I'm a CAA board member, GSAS alumna, and the enthusiastic co-chair of the Leaders Experience. We hope that this program gives you a glimpse into what the CAA provides as part of its programming for alumni and student leaders across the university and the globe. And we also hope that it will inspire you to engage with Columbia in ways meaningfully to you personally, as well as to the important work Columbia does in the world. As we prepare for this evening's discussion of how leadership matters for social justice, inclusion and anti-racism, I have to share that I'm awed by our esteemed panelists who are participating from as close as New York and Washington DC, from my hometown of Chicago and from Cartagena, Colombia. I also want to underscore our collaboration with the Obama Scholars Program. And this evening we have Ana Maria Gonzalez from the inaugural class of Obama Scholars as one of our panelists. I will now turn the program over to our moderator, Alelia Bundles, Columbia trustee, journalist, news producer, Emmy Award winner, and author of the biography of Madam C.J. Walker, upon which the recent Netflix series Self Made was based. Before I turn it over to Alelia, though, I do want to just ask um, that you please remain on at the conclusion of our program to receive information and resources related to the program. So on to you, Alelia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delisa. Lovely to see you virtually and good evening to everyone. Um, I'm Alelia Bundles, Columbia Journalism class of a long time ago. <laughs> I'm happy to add my welcome to you for this evening of Columbia at Home and the Columbia Alumni Leadership Experience as we discuss why leadership matters for social justice, inclusion, and anti-racism. I don't know about you, but every time I've sent an email to friends since March, I've thought more carefully about how I open my email. Usually I just say, well, hope you all is well with you, but these days one just never knows. Are they truly healthy? Have they lost a loved one to COVID? Uh, have they lost a job, a major contract, had some kind of trauma? Are they stressed out from jug juggling distance learning for their kids? Lately, I've been saying instead of hope all is well with you, I hope you are well in these challenging and clarifying times. As of today, more than 227,000 Americans have died as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Nearly 9 million Americans have contracted the, the virus. Internationally, there are 44 million cases and more than a million deaths. And we know in the United States that a disproportionate number of people affected are black and brown. Since May 25th, when George Floyd was killed, we've seen an outpouring of support for Black Lives Matter and an unprecedented amount of reflection and critique around racism and anti-racism. There also has been a great deal of backlash as there always is whenever we collectively make the effort to move toward true diversity, equity, and inclusion. And of course, we are in the last week of an election season of greater consequence than any election of our lifetime. We have an amazing panel this evening to discuss these issues and to discuss leadership. First, I'd like to introduce Ana Maria Gonzalez, who was, uh, as Jalissa said, in the inaugural cohort of Obama scholars at Columbia in 2018 and 2019. Mm -hmm. She is joining us from Cartagena, Colombia, where she is the international cooperation officer in the mayor's office. She is a social innovator and founder of FEM, an organization that helps rural ethnic communities secure land ownership self-governance, and resources guaranteed in Columbia's National Development Plan. Also joining us is Bianca Jones Marlin, who is a principal investigator at Columbia's Zuckerman Institute of Mind, Brain, and Behavior, and an incoming assistant professor of psychology and neuroscience. 
Her intentions to become a teacher changed when a job in a laboratory created a detour that led to a PhD in neuroscience at NYU's School of Medicine. You'll hear more about her research in transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. And finally, John Lovey, uh, who is a graduate of Columbia Law School and a civil rights attorney specializing in wrongful imprisonment and police excessive force, which is a euphemism for police brutality. Uh, he has been described as the go-to lawyer for the wrongfully convicted. After a year as a clerk in the Northern District of Illinois and a year and a half at Sidley and Austin, he started his own firm. Today, he and his wife, Danielle Lovey, had Lovey and Lovey, a firm of 50 attorneys. So now on to our conversation. To all three of you, one thing all of you share in common is the understanding that our society faces systemic problems that create injustice, exclusion, and lack of access in everything from healthcare and living wages to educational opportunities and equal protection under law. These systemic problems are complex and intertwined. Can you talk about how you personally came to pursue, to pursue your own path in addressing these issues? And why don't we start with Anna and then go to Bianca and then to John? Thank you very much, Olivia, especially for inviting me to this interesting conversation with these people that are sitting here with me who are incredible, have incredible paths. Well, about my story, I can just um, tell you that I come from a privileged background and that I had a family and an education that allowed me to understand that it, it was the mission of privileged people to see what gaps um, remained in society to be covered. But then as I grew um, and I realized and I went through my career and my own life experiences, I also understood that I was part of a, min a minority. In Colombia, privileged people don't realize that they come from an ethnic minority. You know, we are, we are, um, we grow up to consider ourselves white, which is uh, pretty paradoxical. And I think that's one of the things that has transformed my path to really recognize myself, even though I have this privileged background, and to really understand myself from the ethnic point of view, to understand how my country is a mixed country and the responsibility that we still have towards ethnic minorities that have been oppressed and denied the same rights that I was given as a privileged and educated person from Bogota. So I started doing my work and understanding that inequality is not a problem of, of distribution, it's a problem of ethics. And that you really, really need to think about how you have to, how you have to behave in terms of the struggle towards more equality. Thank you, Anna. Bianca? Thank you, Alilia. Uh, so I was born here in New York, in Queens, New York. Uh, my mother is from South America, Guyana. My dad's a New Yorker as well, through and through. And although I had the opportunity to grow up with two parents, um, we had the dynamic uh, upbringing of being brought up in a foster home where my biological parents are, were also foster parents to other siblings. And that gave me a really unique insight into uh, the dynamic of how an experience can dictate how someone navigates life, um, a negative and traumatic experience. I, did, I started off as, in education, as earlier stated, I'm not really targeting uh, the fact that I had foster siblings. Really, it was the fact that I had graduated from a high school that would um, be considered now as a failing high school. And although I did very well in school, when I started college at St. John's University in Queens, I was pretty disappointed at the, the direction and mentorship I got. And I felt as if I was, uh, my opportunities were cut short, as if I could have applied to a different school, I could have done better, someone would have directed me. I was the first in my family to ever apply to a uh, four-year college and, and, and get in. So it, I felt a little bit lost and I think a little bit angry. Um, and that led me to say, I need to be a teacher so that people don't have to feel like they've lost um, a, something that was so great in them or they, they've wasted time. Uh, and I'm so thankful that that like anger and disappointment actually directed me to the field of neuroscience where I started teaching 
And I realized teaching in New York City that a lot of my students came from backgrounds similar to my foster kids, my foster siblings. And those backgrounds seem to correlate with poor academic behavior and not. And I really started to question, how can an experience dictate how you learn, how we navigate this earth? Because we all know here being alumni, alumni are associated with Columbia, that education is key and it's essential um, and it's important for leadership. And so I really wanted to see how I could, I could really edify the world in that manner. And that led me down the path of neuroscience. I did research in, in college and that led me to my PhD at NYU and postdoc that I'm finishing now at Columbia before I start as faculty. And I think the combination of understanding how education is essential and also how trauma from past experiences can really dictate how we navigate the world. And now my research is showing how it can be passed on to other generations um, motivates my, my passion for um, change and for protecting. Thank you. you know, it's just so interesting to hear your personal stories on how you got here. I'm sure the, many of the people who are listening have similar kinds of things that help them, help motivate them. Uh, John, let, let talk to us about what brought you to your current path. Well, I started uh, the legal path at Columbia Law School in the mid 90s. And then I came back and went to work for a big uh, law firm then called Sidley and Austin. So many of my classmates just sort of went on that path and nobody asked any questions, just everybody graduated, went to work for the big firms. And a lot of us found ourselves working for, you know, big companies in disputes that were at best neutral on injustice and equity. And, you know, some of us found ourselves sort of on the wrong side of those kinds of things. And I was only at the firm for about a year and a half. And I started my own firm. Uh, I started it basically out of my house, uh, just myself. And I took on uh, social justice causes. Uh, 1983 is the area of law it's called. So I represented people who had been victims of police brutality, who had had their houses searched without authorization, wrongfully convicted, shot by the police, employment discrimination and such. And over time we succeeded and uh, it grew. So then I added another attorney, another attorney. And uh, in the last few decades, it's now up to 50 attorneys. And I'm proud to say that it's not just any attorneys. I mean, it's very, very super qualified, super intense, super uh, effective litigators, people that could be litigators anywhere they wanted, working for any client they wanted at all the big fancy law firms, but they've chosen to uh, align themselves together in fighting uh, social injustice and, and promoting equity. So it's not a nonprofit law firm, which is a little bit unusual. We don't take donations from people where, you know, you read about like uh, EJI, Brian Stevenson's outfit, or the Innocence Project, that are sort of nonprofits. We are a for-profit law firm. We win, you know, wrongful conviction cases. We try to get jury verdicts, but fundamentally, we only take cases where they align with our sense of justice. So to give you an idea of the kinds of cases we take. So in other words, we're not uh, just trying to make the most money we can. We're only taking cases that promote our sense of what we want the world to be. So. In the last year, we, for example, we got involved in the litigation against the Trump administration uh, for the Postal Service when he tried to slow it down in Florida. Uh, we got an injunction along with a bunch of other law firms and organizations. Uh, we represent uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters in Chicago uh, in connection with Trump's attempt to send in federal troops and, uh, and working uh, on behalf of protesters in Colorado as well in a class action. So we've been able to merge class action law that you know other people use in maybe consumer or other kinds of areas. And we've been able to put that in favor of uh, civil rights. Uh, we represent uh, uh, the family of the guy, remember the kid who was shot in Kenosha by that, uh, sorry, the, the man who was shot by the kid with the, with the, with the uh, assault rifle. Uh, we have all kinds of amicus causes where we're uh, representing uh, uh, people trying to pursue uh, things like uh, uh, environmental justice and wrongful convictions. And, uh, and uh, most recently, we just filed a lawsuit uh, for uh, a developer in Chicago uh, blew up a smokestack to develop a target and uh, inflicted all kinds of pollution on a uh, community here, uh, heavily uh, Mexican American and thought they could just get away with it. So uh, one way to push back, and it, admittedly, it's only one case at a time, one, one piece at a time, but uh, there are law firms that have a lot of power, and a lot of times those law firms try to push, you know, corporate agendas. We try to take this law firm, which has now gotten big and has gotten 
uh, some ability to throw its weight around and we try to push back against social injustice. So that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, John. And you know, it is, um, all, all of you bring entirely different perspectives, but I think people are going to see how we weave all of this together because in fact, the people who you are representing are people who, who's res who are people who um, Bianca in some ways is studying how people got into that situation. Um, so Bianca, as a neuroscientist, you've done groundbreaking research on how trauma and stress can be passed from one generation to another, not just psychologically, but genetically. How does this research relate to what we're seeing in communities of color in terms of health outcomes, employment, education, and interaction with law enforcement? Amazing question and so 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 timely. It's something that's been on my mind this past um, 2020 as I set up my and established my lab. The most work done um, in humans, so my work is with uh, mice. I use mice because you can get a little bit more information out of them. Uh, but the work that's been done in humans have looked at people who have survived um, World War II or the Dutch hunger winter. And these are populations that went under um, starvation. And we were able to have researchers who were interested in these communities and really glean a lot of data. And what I've come to realize is that there's so little data surrounding black and brown communities in the United States, black communities in the United States, um, because there are so few re researchers who are invested in studying this. And it's uh, both exciting to enter the field in which um, so little is known, but also very, very saddening to know that, the, to know the reasons and the mechanisms behind that. Um, the walls that are set up institutionally reflect what can be done in our communities um, to, to, get, um, to get answers. And so thinking back to this year, uh, I don't fear any more or less trauma has been done um, to our black and brown community than my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation. Um, I'm living through it now, so I see how um, traumatic it can be, but when I bring this up to um, I, I can't help but to separate my, I can't help but to not separate my work from my personal life. Um, when I bring these uh, situations up to my dad, he's pretty much responding with yes, because this is exactly what happened when he was a teenager in Queens. Um, only a lot worse. Uh, and so it's terrifying to understand that these ramifications have genetic components and epigenetic components that can be passed down. I have a five month old and a three year old. Um, and I understand that my stressors can actually live on in them. Uh, but I also study resilience. And I understand that my mom coming from a third, third world, third world uh, um, developing country and my father growing up in Queens um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, have genetic ramifications, epigenetic ramifications, but also I believe in resilience. And so really understanding the science behind that is what motivates me, especially looking at times like now. Thank you. Um, so John, you've used your legal skills to advance civil rights and social justice, as you were saying, with some notable targets that you mentioned to us. Um, the caseload with uh, the Postal Service, the state of Florida and its efforts to deny the right to vote to formerly incarcerated people and the peaceful protesters in Boulder, Colorado. You mentioned others as well. But can you talk about your business model, which you sort of mentioned, and then the implications for the outcomes of these current cases? Uh, I did mention uh, that uh, we are not a non-for-profit firm. We're a for-profit firm. Uh, so we uh, don't charge any of our clients anything, which is unusual, obviously, for law firms, uh, but it's a contingency model. So if our clients succeed, uh, then we share in the recovery, and we use that to fund our litigation and to fund uh, the cases that we do that don't generate a lot of money. You know, if we're uh, suing uh, the prison to try to get the, them to take COVID seriously and not uh, jeopardize people's lives, there's no money to recover. But by winning big verdicts, jury verdicts in wrongful conviction cases and in police shooting cases, we can distribute it and pay our salaries and then uh, really pay the salaries of lawyers that, as I said, could work anywhere and they're really, really good at what they do and really talented. And then we can fund the other kind of litigation that we're doing. So that's been sort of the way we've combined a for-profit firm with advancing justice as best we can. So, and when you look at some of the cases that are in your uh, caseload right now, what, what, talk to me about one or two of them 
and what you want the outcome to be. And if it doesn't go the way that you want it to go, what are those kind of societal implications? Well, you know, uh, I always say in a civil case, which is what we're doing for money damages, if we're suing for uh, like, you know, trying to get justice in terms of compensation, uh, the consequences aren't as high than for people say facing incarceration and such. Uh, but we're trying to get people justice for, you know, uh, extremely uh, unjust things that have happened in their lives, wrongful conviction cases. People spent 20, 30 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit. After they're exonerated, uh, they have a right to pursue uh, a legal claim against the police, against the state for violating their constitutional rights where appropriate. And uh, I've learned a lot about the criminal justice system and uh, you know some real uh, inequity uh, built in. And hopefully we've exposed that one case at a time. Every time we get a jury verdict for excessive force or a bad police shooting, uh, the police department has to examine themselves and they don't change easily, but it's just one knock at a time. And the goal and the hope is eventually that they will get tired of paying jury verdicts and they're going to say, you know what, like here in Chicago, you know, maybe we got to do something different because it's not efficient to pay out all this money. Maybe we should look at why this is happening. Why, you know, can we do better training? Can we uh, professionalize it in a way that won't lead to these big jury verdicts? So that's right. part of it too. Yeah. I mean, right. The cost, the cost of bad policing. Um, Anna, as co-founder of FEM, you work with rural communities organizing for their rights. And through your work in the mayor's office in Cartagena, you also see how government interacts with human rights issues. Recently in Colombia, indigenous people have marched in Bogota to protest the government. And we're seeing this kind of thing happen all over the world. It's George Floyd, it's Nigeria, it's, uh, it's Colombia. Can you talk about your work and place this, the recent protest in a global context? Thank you, yeah, um, it's a great question. And I think it relates very much to John's work because what we do with um, Afro and indigenous communities is uh, help them litigate for their land rights. Um, indigenous communities in Colombia were only given um, status as citizens in the constitution as of 1991, that is yesterday. Mm -hmm. And before that, I was telling you how white we Colombians think we are, right? So on our understanding of um, our culture being multicultural and having more than 78 different ethnic groups um, is really a, a question of what democracy means. It's actually really a question of how minorities uh, are entitled to different types of rights and how those rights relate to the way they um, exist in the planet. And one of the things that is really, really interesting, I think, about the advancement of these laws in Colombia is that through them, even ecosystems have been given rights as part of, and this is something that is also very studied um, legally in the world, because we have been able to protect rivers as part of the territories of indigenous groups and give rights to ecosystems to protect them from climate change, from depredation. So as we see, I think this, these are all things that evolve what we um, think democracy is. And so what I think that is happening around the world is that those old definitions of what democracy means and how we want to represented and how we want to act, to act out what democracy means to us is falling apart, it's in a crisis, and these new citizenships and these new ways of expressing ourselves are just pushing out and, and pushing forward to bring change. And that's, I mean, I think, very exciting times. And, and that's how my work relates, like my work deep down in the little community relates to what the global definition of democracy will stand for, hopefully in my lifetime. No, you know, I do. I think we're all thinking more internationally than we have, as it, in part because of the pandemic. But we're seeing these upheavals going on throughout the world. Let me just mention to you. I think your microphone may be brushing up against your um, blouse, so just you know, be be mindful of that when we continue. Um, so, for all three of you, as leaders in your own lives. Uh, I'm wondering what advice you might have for our Columbia alumni community and how to be an effective change maker. We can start, Anna, why don't we go in reverse order? We'll start with you. 
Great. Um, I think I have two pieces of advice. One is always persevere. You are usually told that what you are doing is not the right way to do it. Um, and I'm sure both Bianca and John have, have gotten this. Like I have been told many, many, many times that this was the totally wrong path and that was I was completely doing the wrong thing. And I have just stayed on that path. And that's one thing. And then the other thing is always don't be afraid of thinking outside the box and, uh, and of thinking of new ways to approach old problems because there's always um, a way to redefine problems and to, un and to state them in a different way. And that means that very few people can exert huge amounts of change. If I had been told 15 years ago that I could advance the right to land property for 16,000 people, I would have said that it was impossible because I would have done it on my own and I'm not a lawyer. And yet that's what we did with a group of four or five people and then a huge like army of volunteers that helped us out. So things are possible if you are if you give them a creative twist. John Some okay. advice for our Columbia community on leadership and change making. Well, uh Speaking from my experience that, you know, I'm not claiming to be, uh, you know, uh, blazing any trails or anything, but for me, what I did, you know, I was on a path. Uh, I mentioned it earlier in a law firm that wasn't uh, making change and wasn't advancing any justice. And I changed my path. And, you know, that entailed a, a professional commitment different than the one I was making. Uh, but it, it, uh, it did work for me and I encourage others to take that chance if they can and if, if they're able. And it, you know, from the legal side, I know that there's a lot of, of lawyers that have legal skills and talent and they have extra time. And if they wanted to get involved in something like you know, suing the Trump administration or, or, or pursuing uh, some of the kinds of cases I talked about, there are those opportunities. So uh, it's just a matter of making the decision to spend the time and to do it. To use and I suppose that applies to non-lawyers too. You have talents, you've got to decide if you want to use them, make the world more just. Thank you. Bianca. I hear the passion in Anna Maria and John's uh, voice and their conviction. And that just highlights the importance of what they think, what they're doing, how important it is to them. And although other people may navigate the world and never think about um, these injustices, um, injustices surrounding like uh, things that are hard to change like epigenetics um, and trauma. I, my advice would be, if you think it's important, it's probably because it's important. If you don't see that it's important in your surrounding areas because no one's done it before. So stand up and do it. I will be the first black hire in the department of neuroscience um, coming from first generation and first college student and um, you know, a, a failing high school. The, these two things usually don't align um, looking at the trajectory uh, but I know what I'm studying is so important. And although it may only be a small percentage of the population, it's a pop percentage of the population that, that matters. And so whatever that passion is in your heart that you think is important, just keep on walking towards that. And that's bringing justice to the world. Thank you. know, one of the things, John, you were um, being humble. And, <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that is uh, common with all three of you and with truly great leaders is a sense of humility. Um, we're go I'm going to ask you about a call to action, but before I do that, I wanted to just stay with this leadership theme and ask if there are any leaders or any moments of leadership during this year that you have observed and admired. Does anybody come to mind, whoever wants to talk first? I'll take that one. Um, well, I think this one is kind of obvious, but I think I have to mention it. It's Jacinda Arden. I think she has done an incredible job of leading New Zealand and winning the election and completely you know, taking politics uh, into the ground of gender in a way that I think completely restated how things have to go. But also I have to go to local leadership. Um, Claudia Lopez, the mayor of, of, of Bogota, who's actually a Colombia alumni. Um, she's the first uh, female uh, mayor that, that uh, uh, Bogota has ever had. And she has done an incredible job at attending the COVID crisis. So I really, really um, think 
she has to be mentioned because she has been a role model, mixing both like straight decisions with a sense of care for the people and, and, and really mourning for the situation, for the sad situation that we've been in, being very, very responsible and very stern about decisions, which I think has been admirable. Right, and we know that takes courage. <laughs> Um, John? Well, uh, I, leadership is something I think about, you know, quite a bit because, uh, you know, in my role at the firm, so I try to be better at it. I heard on the radio today, our governor here in Illinois uh, defending, he said, you know what, uh, high school basketball is not going to be played this year. And he could have gone either way on that one. Uh, and he did not make, that's not a popular decision. I know in my own family, that's not popular with my kid. Uh, and it would have been very easy for him to say, you know what, I'm, you know, I'm going to let him play basketball because everybody's going to yell at me. That's what leadership is. You know, he did something courageous that's unpopular because in the good of the constituents, it's probably on balance better. And he knows he's going to take criticism for it. He knows it would have been easier to go the other way. And he did it anyways. And that's leadership. Exactly. Exactly. Bianca? Uh, my department um, at the Columbia University Zuckerman Institute, it's a new institute um, on 125th in mind, brain, and behavior, really took a stance this year. Um, it's something that uh, was surprising and refreshing to know that the senior leadership um, did not have to make such a bold claim of Black Lives Matter, but they chose to. Um, and it wasn't just a surprise, it was a surprise for a majority of, of, of our institute, which um, in itself is a little bit saddening, but also inspiring. Uh, that we can take maybe individuals who haven't directly suffered um, under the hands of racism or police brutality, even some that may have perpetuated it, um, being able to stand up and say, we see these faults and we're taking a step towards um, a bold step, not just a, a secret step, a bold step towards making change. And to have that pasted around my institute, if you go down on 125th, you see it on the walls of, um, of our building, Black Lives Matter um, and, and the Black Fist. Uh, to have it written out in email. Those are things that I know we see often and we see on Instagram and we see on, on social media, but that takes courage. And I've come to realize that. And so I'm very proud of my institute for taking those steps. You know, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that because it reminds me really that throughout Columbia, there is a great commitment to anti-racism from President Bollinger's office throughout the administration, some of the anti-racism training that is going on among faculty and staff. Uh, certainly at CAA, we are doing work on belonging and inclusion. So there is a strong commitment in this community that all of the people who are listening can, can be a part of. Before we go to questions from our audience, I'm just wondering if each of you might have a, a call to action, something that you would like to encourage our uh, community to participate in or to support. Bianca, since, you're, since your mic is open, would you like to go? <laughs> uh, yes, I think my call to action, um, a lot of people are taking the steps to make the big change and I really appreciate that. But we can't forget um, our neighbors, our friends, um, the day-to-day -day people we come in contact with as um, Alila, you opened up saying like who may be struggling because of jobs, because of COVID, because of blatant racism, because of um, introspectively realizing that maybe they have contributed to this racism. Checking in with our neighbors, checking in with our friends. My call to action is checking in with your immediate circle. People you see every day that you may not even question how they're doing, or you may start the emails with hope all as well. Um, people are, are, are stressed and struggling right now. And to the extent that we can buffer each other, this is not just um, my belief, this is actually scientific, um, conspecific buffering of just having someone close to you, having someone um, support you actually helps mediate stress hormones like cortisol, helps mediate stress. So just reaching out can really change someone's world right now. I mean, I think we sometimes um, overlook self-care uh, and care for others, but we are, I think we're particularly feeling that right now. Uh, John? It's a funny question because it's almost it feels presumptuous for me or you know to tell people you know this is what you should do <laughs> that's not a natural thing to do but if you're asking me to try uh, I think our country is needs to heal I think we've had a tough four years and maybe it's, it's not safe to talk about politics in a forum like this but I will take the courageous step step of saying for me not for others for me I believe uh, that we've had a rough go and that uh, I'm hopeful that whatever happens and whatever your political beliefs are, that the country can improve its trajectory uh, in terms of feeling 
uh, more together and uh, less disharmony. And uh, that starts on an individual level. So I hope all of us can uh, pull together uh, and try to win back some of what what was working better than it has been lately. Right. We've got a we've got a vote, and we've got a lot of healing. Anna. My call to action is to always look around, keep your eyes open to see who is missing at the table, because for sure, there's always going to be people missing at the table in every decision. The decisions you make at home include your children in the decisions that you make in your company, in your projects, who is being excluded, who is not being asked. And because everybody's perspective is to be taken into account if we are really committed to fighting against exclusion and racism and discrimination, then that means that we are old enough to include people's perspectives and change towards them. Thank you. I, you know, I'm just going to mention this. I, I listened today to two hours of my hometown of Indianapolis, the Central Indiana Community Foundation did a whole afternoon of anti-racism with leaders around the city pledging for to inclusion, which was stunning to me from central Indiana. But people, there is this sense, uh, despite the backlash, that we really do have to use this moment of reckoning. So I, you all have just been great. We've got some wonderful questions from the audience. I'm seeing something, let's see, from uh, Margaret Robeson. Uh, what does the panel think about some of the corporate action like pledging money to racial equity, black business owners, homeowners, et cetera. Is this something you think will continue and make a difference? Whoever would like to jump in. I can jump in. Um, I think uh, one has to be very careful about giving and both because it's, um, it requires responsibility but also because I really believe that some type of giving disenfranchises communities. Mm -hmm. We have to be very responsible on to what should be given to the communities and what they should be allowed to do and decide for themselves. And I think that this should always be taken into account. One of the reasons why we created our organization was because we were tired of uh, black people always being treated as subjects of charity as if they could not take part in their own decisions and be politically active and just do things for themselves. We believe that they needed the legal support that they couldn't get because they didn't have um, lawyers. But after that, after the legal support, we allow them to just make their projects, their plan of life to just flourish. That's not, not our problem because we trust that they will be able to do it on their own. That's also part of inclusion. To not be paternalistic about the John Bianca, any thoughts on that question? Um, I agree with Anna uh, Maria. It's it's a facet. Gifting and giving is a facet of of anti racism and of standing up as a leader. Um, is it essential? Yes. Is it extremely important? Yes. But it can't be the only way. Um, as a a a, lo an, a lab a, a principal investigator of a lab. Uh, we can be seen as small business owners. We need to keep our um, our, our income coming in, um, from, usually from the government through the National Institute of Health, um, to get to get our science done. And we also uh, reach out to private um, private sponsors. And the stats show, the data show that race and or like name that's associated with a minority um, group will disproportionately affect the funding that you have and will disproportionately affect the publications that you have and the references of those publications. And so taking a stance to say, I know that there's a wall built up for labs run by black and brown people and, as, and women as well, um, I'm going to pretty much tip that scale by edifying with money, 100% okay. As long as we're also saying I gave money so I, I don't have to worry about the racism that's associated with that and the racist tendencies that are associated with that. It's part of the effort, but it can't be the only part. John, I see you've unmuted yourself. Oh, I, I, I agree with Anna Maria and Bianca. You know, it's an extraordinary time where companies feel obliged that if they don't do something, they're not doing something. But uh, that a gesture is just that—a gesture. You know, obviously, like you said, it's a time of reckoning. Hopefully, it will inspire real change, and 
not just, uh, hey, can we buy uh, some guilt off by throwing some money around? Uh, but there seems to be some momentum to make some serious real changes and I hope it happens. Yeah, you know, and I am, since I told you all that I graduated a long, long time ago, I am of that sort of that first generation who benefited from affirmative action and some of those doors being opened. And so I see the, we need more people in the pipeline replaying, but I do think it feels different. And I think some of the backlash, the, the strength of the backlash tells me that it is different because there wouldn't be so much backlash. Some, um, let me just, this was a good question. Uh, Esther Chung has said, um, thank you all for sharing your experience and wisdom. For each of the panelists, um, if you had one book to recommend other than Citizen or How to Be Anti-Racist, <laughs> what would it be? Anything that you're reading, I, since um, it's, I will start. Um, the Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, because the, I, the disenfranchisement, lack of wealth, you know, as Reverend Barber says, low wealth communities, not low income communities, because the wealth has not been created because of the housing policy. So um, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein is something that I would recommend. Whoever wants to jump in. John, anything you're reading that you would recommend? Uh, I just finished uh, The Biggest Bluff, a book about poker. Uh, and from a psychology standpoint, actually, uh, and the sort of the theme is poker is sort of like life. You know, uh, you got to be uh, bold sometimes. You got to bluff sometimes. And I really recommend it. Uh, uh, on the social justice side, the Brian Stevenson book was excellent. Uh, you know, he's, he's doing the kind of work uh, that all of us aspire to do. Right. One of my book club members wants us to read that poker book. <laughs> it's really interesting. <laughs> Anna Maria. Okay, one I, I, I read a couple of years ago, and then I come back to because I think it's very, very interesting. It's called The Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. Um, I, it's a book about not trying to exert change by completely changing and turning over everything, but just by giving nudges, by finding the way, the tipping point finding the ways to push things in the direction that you want them to be pushed. I thought it was very interesting and I refer back to it every time. Great, Bianca? I, I, when you ask that question, I feel guilty with this response, but it really is going to be like a, a high school throwback, but it's a high school throwback that gave me such perspective um, that I did not have. Um, and that's going to be Native Son by Richard Wright. I remember reading that and I, I review it um, often where my heart was beating the entire book with the level of like stress and anxiety of this of this character. And to have that perspective be brought out in books, because that's the benefit of books, right? You're getting someone else's perspective and you're pretty much living in it during the time that you're reading the book, um, just forced me to think a little bit differently about how, how I navigate this world. Yes, I'm a black woman. Yes, I'm a mom. Yes, I'm in science, the first generation, but I'm not a black man. And that gave me a perspective um, of deep thought that I hadn't tapped into before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so maybe we will, at, at the end, we'll, we'll have a book reading list that um, Donna and Ken and Jenna can share with everybody. So uh, John, this one is specifically for you. Um, Jean Golden is asking, is there, a is there a law firm in New York comparable to yours? Well, uh, there, are, there is a firm, uh, Newfield and Scheck, that specializes in wrongful conviction cases. Uh, so, but they're sort of, you know, laser focused on that. Uh, I'm not aware of a, a law firm in, New and there, and by the way, they're in New York, there is a pretty mature civil rights bar. So there are a lot of lawyers that will do police shootings, police brutality, stuff like that. Uh, but there, to be honest with you, there's no firms comparable anywhere of our size, because uh, we're now practicing all over the country. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of firms in New York that do civil rights work. In fact, New York, one of the top three cities, I would say, in the country where there are a lot of lawyers doing this kind of work, but mostly small. Thank you. Uh, so Ana Maria, this is for you from Julia Carranza. Um, what are the most serious social problems in Colombia, according, according to you? What, you know, what's your view on that? I saw that question and almost fainted, um, but... Uh, <laughs> I think that we have a very serious problem that we don't um, take into account. And it is the fact that we need to create bridges for intercultural dialogue. 
I strongly believe that most of our problems come from the fact that we have never established channels to beat all the different um, specificities of regions and of peoples in our country. Our country is a mix. It never went through a process that I think the US, for example, went through, which was to understand itself as a united something. We have never performed that act of understanding ourselves as a union of anything. And I think that's what repeatedly breaks us apart. It, the other big problem is definitely drug trafficking, but that's just the way um, we are being depicted. Because I think that it's just the business that is being performed through drugs in the United States, in Mexico. And we're like, there's a lot of people making a lot of money up in the North and we're just putting all the dead people. Um, so, so I don't really think that's our problem. I think that's a global problem. The, the local Colombian issue is intercultural dialogue. Thank you. So Bianca, I think this one is for you. Um, Beth Broad says, I've been doing uh, DEI consulting for large companies and I'm struck by the opportunity within corporations to make more progress towards racial and social injustice than we seem to be able to make in our highly polarized society. Even so, the challenge is to bridge some big entrenched divides. Are there biochemical differences in those willing to examine their assumptions and learn and those who are armed literally and figuratively against change? And can we find some ways to bridge the gap? I, that may be an entirely different set of mice. Oh, that's a, yeah, exactly. That's something, <laughs> a whole new field of study that I'm excited, excited to um, dig through. That question is so poignant because what we're asking is how do we let defenses down to let knowledge in, to let learning in? And what we do see if we were to take it strictly biological is when um, an organism is focused on survival, focused on defense um, and focused on, um, uh, I guess for lack of better words, like um, superiority uh, in hierarchy. So we're talking about just mammals um, established hierarchy. Um, it's hard for them to learn a task. So we'll treat or teach our mice how to learn a task, how to push a lever. But if they're caged with, um, with uh, dominant males, it's harder for them to learn these tasks. If they're constantly under stress, it's harder for them to perform. So with our animals, we try to make sure they're very, very um, stress-free, except for the, ex the experiences that they're having. Can that be picked up and just mirrored in society? I think yes. Um, until we let down this defense, decrease our cortisol, no one's going to hear what you're saying when the immediate thing is making sure you survive this conversation. And I think that's, that's we can definitely dig into the science and use that to apply. And it's hard because that means we have to make people who we may not always agree with feel safe in order to have that conversation. And we also see that that's pretty polarized when it comes to racial um, groups in the United States where one group is making the other one feel comfortable even though it's a group that's usually um, demeaned in the conversation. But without those steps, we won't be able to get to the to hearing part. And so I think from both sides, it's making whoever you're speaking with feeling, feel comfortable enough. And also those who feel defensive understand you're never going to get anywhere in the conversation. It's not a direct attack on you. It's a reflection of our society. And if you really can, you want to make a difference. It means taking a step back, listening, breathing, releasing that cortisol so you can perform the task. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when people are, we've heard conversations, if you have a family member who is enthralled with QAnon, like don't attack them, but uh, give them an opportunity to say what they say. So I can't believe how quickly this hour has gone by. Um, but be, just to close, I would like to just ask each of you, um, you know, as we approach this, this election and this time that we're in, uh, is there anything that particularly frightens you or anything that particularly gives you hope? It can be either or both. Uh, Anna? Well, the extreme polarization of the world frightens me a lot because I think we're going rapidly into extremism, into literally going into killing each other. Our country knows uh, what that means very well. We, we we're, were at war for 60 years and are probably now going back into it. And um, I think that is very sad and that frightens me a lot. Uh, what gives me hope in listening to Bianca is that I think that it's probable that um, I think science tells us that stressors can be inherited, but probably resilience can also be inherited. 
and that would make vulnerable communities stronger and better than communities of privilege. So I'm sure that that's going to change generationally and, and, and I'm really happy to be a, a little bit, a little element of that change in my life. John? Mm, I think uh, it is a little disturbing, you know, the direction our country has gone. And uh, I think what gives me hope is that, you know, there's been a very uh, dangerous and unappealing viewpoint thrown out there. And while a disturbing number of Americans seem to have jumped onto it, the majority has not. And what gives me hope is that uh, I believe the country uh, rejected and will reject uh, the, the partisan and, and uh, extreme and somewhat hateful message uh, that has been pervaded. And it, uh, it feels to me like the majority of the people don't want that. And that gives me hope. Bianca. I, I, have, I have a son and a daughter. And at times I do fear for the world that they're growing up in. Um, simple things like bringing them to daycare around the days of the election um, to when I'm not around and they're adults. Uh, and that, that, that scares me on, a, on a, a personal level. But what I do know is that I can influence them and I can influence my small circles around me. And I can make sure that they're loving, caring individuals who sees people as individuals who are important. And so there lies the, the, the balance of, um, of the epigenetic stressors, but also the resilience. It's not just totally inherited. It's not just totally learned. It's both. And I, as a mother, I, as an educator, I, as a psychologist, I, as a neuroscientist, have a way to take steps in both directions. So I will do it boldly by the time I'm here on this earth. Thank you. This has just been incredible. Um, I, we could go on for another hour and we just, I am so grateful to uh, the CAA for bringing you together, bringing all of us together and offering this opportunity to share with the larger Columbia community. So I thank you, Ana Maria, Bianca, and John for just a really terrific conversation. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. If you are interested in volunteering and leadership opportunities in the alumni community, visit alumni.columbia.edu to get involved with your regional club, a shared interest group, alumni voices, and more. Or explore volunteer opportunities on volunteer.alumni.columbia.org. You can also contact your school alumni association for opportunities at the school level. Don't forget that today is Columbia Giving Day. Uh, we still have uh, four more hours. Co Giving Day 2020 is an opportunity to enjoy an, an incredible day of university-wide impact and to support our resilient students, faculty, and researchers who are making a positive difference across the globe during this critical moment. You can make your gift and get involved by visiting givingday.columbia.edu. Next week's Columbia at Home will be Sustainable Agriculture, Sustainable Communities with Julie Johnson of Trace Sabre Winery, Angel Munez, Associate Research Scientist at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society at the Earth Institute, Carmen Gonzalez Romero, Country Manager for Latin America and the Caribbean and research associate at the Earth Institute and moderator John Furlow, deputy director for humanitarian assistance and international development of Columbia University's International Institute for Climate and Society. That will be November 4th from seven to 8 p.m. Eastern time. And you can add the session to the registration you used for tonight's session or within the Columbia Alumni Leadership Experience Conference app. Recordings of previous programs in this series are also available for viewing. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our panelists and good night.